Jewish channels with a review of turmoil in Israel and Jews respond in the U.S., then why this actor is dancing with our reporter, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello, and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Observers are calling it a new low in Israel-United States relations, even amid several years of low points. The administration of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced construction of approximately 1,000 new housing units in East Jerusalem, and the verbal fireworks immediately started flying. This sort of action would be incompatible with the pursuit of peace, said a State Department spokesperson, adding, if Israel wants to live in a peaceful society, they need to take steps that will reduce tensions. Netanyahu on Tuesday replied to the statement, declaring, quote, these words are detached from reality, and adding, quote, we will continue to build in Jerusalem our eternal capital. It is the criticism of that construction which is making peace more distant. This comes after a week in which two people were killed in a terror attack when a suspected Hamas militant rammed his car into a light rail station. Both of those killed were tourists in Israel. Three-month-old Chaya Zissel Braun was visiting Israel with her parents from Rockland County, who were also injured. And 22-year-old Karen Yamima Muscara was reportedly a tourist from Ecuador in the process of converting to Judaism. Tensions are also mounting around increased visits to the Temple Mount by Israeli lay people, rabbis, and politicians. Jerusalem Mayor Nir Barkat ascended the mount Tuesday, accompanied by Israeli police commander Avi Biton. His visit followed one by Palestinian Authority Prime Minister Rami Hamdallah on the day prior. And then there's an announcement by Israel's defense minister that Palestinians will be banned from Jewish-owned buses in the West Bank. Israel's attorney general has asked the defense minister for an explanation for that action. But when it comes to tensions of a more informal nature, Israel's new president has announced a goal to fight anti-Arab racism in Israel, declaring in a speech, quote, Israeli society is sick and it is our duty to treat this disease. Meantime, a measure to offer more access to conversion courts in Israel passed a committee vote in Knesset after months of delay. The decision should offer those converting or having their conversions examined in Israel more options for a rabbinical court to choose and possibly somewhat liberalize the process. But on the topic of conversions and other matters in Israel, Americans who want to know how they'll be treated gathered at an event this week, as Christian Neiden reports. An after-work gathering sponsored by the American Jewish Committee of New York this week undertook a rather large topic of discussion, practical alternatives to Israel's chief rabbinate's power over conversions, marriage, and divorce. The modest event was a timely one, coming on the heels of the AJC publicly supporting passage of a conversion bill introduced by Knesset member Eleazar Stern of the Hatnua Party which sought to broaden access to conversion through the enactment of local rabbi-run conversion courts. The AJC is building a coalition of groups in America and Israel to advocate for change on socio-religious issues in Israel, and the leaders of two of them joined AJC Director of Contemporary Jewish Life Department, Stephen Baim, at this event to speak about their views on various hot-button issues. We uh, formulated a Jewish Religious Equality Coalition, which is a large, broad-ranging broad coalition from Orthodox to Reform and secular Jewish organizations, individuals who are committed to um, changing the status quo with respect to uh, the chief rabbinate, its monopoly on personal status issues. We see the current existing status quo as damaging in terms of, number one, uh, democracy in Israel, and number two, is ultimately corrosive of the U.S.-Israel relationship. People seeking to get married or divorced or to convert to Judaism in Israel must do so through the chief rabbinate an exclusively orthodox rabbinic body. By contrast, in America, one can choose to have these religious rites performed by rabbis of whichever denomination one likes. And in the case of marriage and divorce, one can bypass religious authorities altogether. One of the members of the AJC's coalition is conservative Masorti movement leader and rabbinical assembly executive vice president, Rabbi Julie Schoenfeld who said studies back up Baim's assertion about the negative effects of this religious status quo in Israel. The Jewish People Policy Institute has actually come to see and to acknowledge explicitly religious freedom and Jewish pluralism as a core security issue for the state of Israel. People might not be aware that Israel's own government security establishment has come to recognize and has put full-time staff 
on to the issue of Jewish pluralism, Jewish peoplehood. Schoenfeld said those excluded by Orthodox definitions of who is a Jew are an important factor in U.S.-Israel relations. To see more from this AJC discussion on alternatives to Israel's chief rabbinate, please tune into the full broadcast edition of the Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. You've seen his parenting prowess as one of three men taking care of a little baby, then a little lady. But now actor Steve Gutenberg has authored a children's book, and he told Meredith Gansman why he thinks your kids should read it. A boy from Brooklyn grows up to be a Hollywood celebrity and is now a children's book author. I sat down with Steve Gutenberg at Books of Wonder to learn all about the kids from Disco. The Kids from Disco is about four kids who have an uncle who is stuck in the 70s, a time Gutenberg very much enjoyed. There were really fun things like disco music and, uh, and lava lamps and mood rings and Huckapoo shirts and polyester. And disco was the music keeping the decade moving. I would say Disco Inferno uh, was one of my favorite songs and also all of Casey's Sunshine Band, of course, and La Freak was great. It's the kids from disco and their uncle Steve's mission to save the music. At one point they find out that he's really a superhero, Disco Man, and they actually join him as his discoettes uh, to sort of save the world from the um, the dissolving of music by Melvis Pelvis, who's a very, very angry and mean villain. Gutenberg is fairly new to writing books, having released his memoir, The Gutenberg Bible, in 2012. First, he made his mark in Hollywood. You make me sick. Thank you, sir. I make everybody sick. So, Steve, how did you go from the acting side of things to being a writer? And, and you're a memoir, I know, a children's book. What was that transition like? Well, I was really lucky to have uh, two nieces and two nephews who inspired me to write the book. But it's Gutenberg's parents who he says have taught him the most important lessons. Still, the, my, my mother and father's kitchen table is the best place in the world to be. Is there one most important lesson that you learned at that kitchen table with your parents? Yes, I did. When the ice cream goes down, go get that ice cream because before you know it, it's going to be gone. So my mother would put a big bowl of ice cream and I, I really learned to go quick. <laughs> but could I learn disco from Steve? I thought disco looked like this. It does. It does? Or we're maybe, do, we're, we're doing a, maybe different a, disco. a hustle? Okay, we're doing a different disco. Don't forget, he once competed in Dancing with the Stars. Dancing is kind of his thing. So I tried to pick up a move. Okay. And then you go like this. Yeah. You're going to like, kind of come in like this. Oh, oh, I got You're, you're, you're going to come in like this. Yeah. Then you're going to go out like this, and mm. now I'm going to dip you. Okay, I'm okay. ready for it. Ready? ready. Uh-huh. But we're going to go toward that way. We're going to go... And then you put your little face in there. <laughs> and to see more from Steve Gutenberg and the kids from Disco, tune into the full broadcast version of The Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Finally, on this week's episode of Up Close, we're looking at what it means to build and destroy civil societies. A lot of hope accompanied the end of the Soviet Union, and with good reason for many territories and countries that fell within the Iron Curtain. But under Vladimir Putin, Russia now has less wealth per person than India, while a band of 100 or so billionaires rules the roost alongside their president. Karen Dewisha puts together all the pieces for us in Putin's kleptocracy, Who Owns Russia? After the Soviet Union's fall, many describe the areas left as a Wild West, but imagining a true new Wild West is novelist Eden Lepucky, author of California. And then, looking at what kind of development has accompanied Jewish migration is sociologist Deborah Dash Moore with her book, Urban Origins of American Judaism. But now, here are the highlights from my interview with Miami University professor Karen Dewisha on Putin's kleptocracy. So who does own Russia? Well, a small group around Vladimir Putin, uh, 110 billionaires, according to a report that came out last year with Credit Suisse, which is in the book, uh, own 35% of the wealth of Russia. So we're not talking about a 1% problem. We're talking about a 35% problem. It's a, a very, very small group. It seems like the much larger crime is that in order to take that little bit for themselves, they sold a ton of Russian resources uh, without getting any profit for, the, for Russia, right. for the people, right? right? I mean, very often what would happen is that the state, you know, would invest its money in developing a resource, and then at the moment that that resource was ready to come online, that, 
that now state-owned company would be privatized to insiders, and they would reap the profit. So you have this kind of governing principle in, of the Putin regime that they're nationalizing the risk and they're privatizing the reward. So this 110, they don't have a lot of skin in the game themselves. Right, and one of the more damning aspects of this is that where, where we often say, well, capitalism on its own can create a certain demand for proper procedures, proper mm -hmm. courts and so forth, because the people with the money want to be able to hold on to it and don't want bandits at their door and so forth. But you suggest that because of our globalized economy, they can park their money somewhere else and be just fine. Yeah. I mean, they're, they have an interest in being able to maraud freely through the Russian economy because they've got their money in Switzerland, Cyprus, British Virgin Islands, or wherever, and it's nicely protected. So they don't have an interest in the rule of law. It, it actually would slow them down in Russia if, if there were rule of law. So th I think that's, that's very, very critical. You can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish Channel on cable. You can also listen to the full audio of Up Close as a podcast, available on iTunes or in your favorite podcast player. That's all for this week. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable, Time Warner Cable Channel 1640, Ioplum Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast on the on-demand menu on the Jewish Channel. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.